The date is November 7, 1996. We're with Dario Gabay, interviewer with Carol Stolberg, in the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, the United States of America, language spoken English. I'm Carol Stolberg, S-T-U-L-B-E-R-G. I have the privilege of interviewing Mr. Dario Gabay on November the 7th, 1996, in Los Angeles, California, the United States of America. The language will be English. Good morning, Mr. Gabay. Good morning. Um, could you please start by giving us your full name? My full name is uh, David Dario Gabay. And could you spell it for us, please? G G A B B A I. Is this the name you were given at birth? Yes. Do you have any other names, any Hebrew or nicknames? No, that's that's the full name. Could you please tell us where and when you were born? I was born in Thessaloniki or Salonika, Greece at that time uh, in September 2nd, 1922. And how old are you today? Today I'm 74 years old. What were the names of your parents, please? My parents, my father was Victor Gabay and my mother was Rosa Beraha Gabay. Where were your parents originally from? Originally we, we started from the Spanish Inquisition, 1492 from Spain going across the continents and uh, my father and mother were born in Smyrna, Turkey and then going back they went to Salonika at that time and then became Salonika became Greece, you know, from Greece. What was your father's occupation? My, my father uh, worked all his life uh, as a typographer for a Greek newspaper called in the Nealithia, which means New, uh, new uh, Truth. And uh, it worked there all, since uh, we went back to, to Poland. Did your mother ever work? My mother never worked. She used to stay home, take care of the kids. <laughs> And how many kids were there in your family? Uh, we were uh, three brothers. And uh, I, I was the middle one. Uh, Jack, or Jacob, was the uh, older one. And Samuel was the youngest one. And uh, could you tell me when they were born so we know the differences in your ages? Well, my, my brother, the older one, was born in 1913. I was born in 1922. And uh, Samuel was uh, 1932. Uh, and did you have any other siblings at all that you knew about, sisters or other brothers? There was one sister that was died at birth, you know, in the 30s. Tell us, please, what your life was like as a boy in Salonika. We were Italian citizens living in Greece, and we used to have a permit to work there, but we were permanent residents of Greece. And uh, we had to go every year to uh, just renew our permit to work. Uh, mostly, I went to an Italian school and uh, where we, we had to learn about four languages. And it uh, was a beautiful school, but at that time was uh, the era of the fascist government in, in Italy. And uh, uh, I finished in 1938 uh, the high school <coughs> of the Italian school, and uh, I was ready to go to a, an Italian university, study mostly I like to be a doctor, but uh, unfortunately at that time, in 1938, Hitler and Mussolini got together and uh, they didn't let any more Jewish Italians go to the in Italian universities. Before we uh, get quite that far in your story, let me take you back a little bit to when you were younger and you were just a young boy. What kind of a neighborhood did you live in? We live in mostly in a Jewish neighborhood. The, uh, we live in a quarter called 151 in Salonika. Actually, the Jewish community bought all that section from, actually, there were barracks of the Italian army from the First World War. And uh, 
when the when the first world war finished you know in 1919 that there was left over and the Jewish community bought it and we were living there practically for very little money you know and uh, in this neighborhood where you lived did you have a lot of close relatives living by uh, maybe grandparents or uncles and aunts well the my grandparents on my on my uh, mother's side were living were living with us in the well, same in the same uh, actually in the same house. What were their names? Uh, their names were, uh, uh, her name was Allegra, you know, and uh, his name was uh, Bohor. And their last name? Their, uh, the, the last name were Baraja. What uh, type of activities did you used to like to do as a young boy? Well, we had a lot of activities in the Italian school, actually a lot of athletic activities there. And uh, we, I was also going every year. The school took us for two, three months in the summer to Italy, free, you know. And uh, we, at that time, I used to play in a band uh, with the clarinet. Did you enjoy playing the clarinet? Yes, it was very much. It was beautiful. We, we used to go to, they used to take us to uh, uh, Como, the Lago Como, in, and then to Cortina d'Ampezzo, you know. The, and in, then the last month we used to uh, be in Rome. We used to go about for seven days by boat from, uh, from Salonica to Italy, and from there was a beautiful three months during the summer because... Uh, we didn't cost us anything. What about uh, your friends? What kind of friends did you have in, it, in Salonika? Well, we have, you know, in, in, uh, were enough uh, Jewish Italians, uh, Jewish Italian colony in Salonika, and uh, lots of them were well, well-to-do people. And I had a, quite a few friends, and one of the, fr the friends is, was Daniel ben Nachmias that uh, later on we spent the uh, most of our lives together. Uh, what was the Jewish community like in Salonika? Was, uh, I wasn't involved too much in the Jewish, but the Jewish community of Salonika, where before the war, the Jewish population in Salonika was close to 100,000, in 200,000 population was 50%. And uh, uh, I remember that on Saturdays, especially the port of Salonika was closed because none of the Jewish people would work, and downtown was closed every Saturday. There, there were a lot of synagogues and a lot of uh, different uh, other uh, institutions that were helping the poor people of, of the Jewish poor people in Salonika. What about uh, Jewish observance in your family? What was it like? Well, my, my mother was uh, pretty good in observing the Jewish uh, tradition, and I and my father were more liberals at that time. What about your grandparents? Were they My grandparents who were, you know, pretty, pretty good. They, my grandparents and my mother's family were pretty religious. Did you go to synagogue with your family? Uh, very seldom I went to the synagogue with my family, but my mother, I know, used to go every every Saturday, and especially during the Jewish holidays. During the Jewish holidays, we all went together. What were the Jewish holidays like in Greece? How were they celebrated? Well, well very, they, they celebrate every every holiday, you know. Uh, there were so many, so many Jewish institutions, so many things, and schools, and... Uh, and elementary schools and Jewish schools, you know. So it was very pretty good Jewish life. What about Jewish holidays in your home? M my home, uh, we used to, to have our Jewish holidays. My mother always saw that we were there for the Jewish holidays. What was your favorite? My favorite was always uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. <laughs> Why was that? Well, uh, these were the high holidays, but uh, everybody used to get dressed and, you know, like the old, old time. <laughs> How was uh, a Passover at your house, let's say? What kind uh, of food did your mother prepare? Prepare the the food that uh, the, the Sephardic used to, to have, and uh, we were... Uh, were enough, you know, we used to be maybe eight, ten people, you get together and 
we had a very, very interesting dinner during the Jewish holiday, you know, the Passover. Tell, tell us about it. Describe us. Describe it for us. Tell us. Well, you know, they, they, the Sephardics made very, very good uh, stuff. We, we used to have uh, the uh, chicken and rice and beans, you know, that the part of it, and uh, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables. Everything, the, no matter what, how poor we were, you know, always during the holidays, the table was always full of food. What was the relationship like between you and your brothers? We were, uh, with my older brother, I, I wasn't too close, you know. We were different about nine years, I think, eight, nine years. So uh, we were together on many occasions, but uh, we weren't as close as we should be. My uh, younger brother was was too young, you know, at that time. But we we were very a family, very loving family, <clears throat> always from the start. You know, the parents always they they were very good parents. I had very good parents. Always they loved us and they gave us as much as they could do. What kind of relationship did you have with your father? My father, very, very close relationship. With father and mother are very, very close. I used to go with my father. I remember <clears throat> before he goes to, to work, we used to go and fish pro practically two, three times a week. Used to walk in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, for about 30 minutes to get to the sea from our uh, place where we really live. And, and you just go, it was a big... Uh, at that time, an Italian Jew had the biggest, uh, the Alatini, they call it Alatini. They, they were making uh, the, um, um, <clears throat> what they call it, uh, they were uh, meals. They were, <clears throat> so, and they had a long, uh, um, what they call it, uh, uh, a long um, to go to sea, you know, they, they had a, um, Cut it before. You mean like a uh, a platform? Oh, you, know. you mean like the pier? Yeah, a pier. They had a pier going all the way there, and we used to go to the pier and stay there until the time from five thirty, six o'clock until eight thirty, where my father used to go to work. What kind of fish did you catch? We used to catch. Uh, they call it in Italian. They call it bronzino, which is a uh, striped bass. And what would happen to the fish? Would well, your mother? We used to, yeah, we used to take it uh, in the evening. We used to have a full meal at home. You know, my mother was waiting all the time to have a fresh fish, fresh fish for dinner. Who used to have to clean the fish? <laughs> she has to clean the fish. <laughs> she had to do everything. Um, tell me, as a young boy, did you belong to any uh, youth organizations or any kind of Jewish? We used to belong at that time. We were Italian uh, Jews. We used to belong to the an Italian organi youth organization at school. This is the organization who used to take us to Italy every every year for for free for vacation. Did you have a bar mitzvah? I think I had a bar mitzvah. I don't remember exactly, but I had a bar mitzvah. <laughs> so, so you have no recollection that you could tell us about no, it? No. Describe the house that you lived in. What did it look like? Well, uh, the, we were uh, at least uh, the house. We, we had two bedrooms for one bedroom for us, one bedroom for our grandparents, and on the other side were another two bedrooms for another family that uh, was the Modiano family that lived with us for many, many years. <clears throat> Were they also a Jewish family? Yeah, Jewish Italian. Um, was there, in, in Salonika, was there any kind of differentiation between the Italian Jews and the Greek Jews, would you say? Uh, well, the Italian Jews, we were always going to Italian affairs, you know, at that time. That, that's why we weren't, uh, some of the, <clears throat> there were Italian Jews that were very powerful, and they were also involved in all the Jewish affairs. But uh, we were, uh, but the Italians had a lot of affairs at that time, you know. They had uh, dances, and so we used to go there because we were part of it. What language did you speak at home? 
We speak a couple of languages. We 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 speak we spoken Greek, uh, Italian, and uh, Ladino. Among yourselves, when you were together with your immediate family, what would you speak usually? We speak mostly Greek and Ladino. That's the two languages we we used to speak. And when you were with your friends, what languages did you speak with your friends? Ah, uh, we were speaking <laughs> Greek actually with um, our friends. Would you say that uh, all of your friends were uh, Jewish, or did you have Gentile friends as well? We had uh, we had quite a few Gentile friends, you know, but mostly were Jewish. Our friends were mostly Jewish, because at one point uh, when I was uh, uh, in the Italian school, I used to belong also to the um, to a Jewish organizations, you know, the the um, Zabotinsky actually. What did you do while you were there? Well, we were uh, always, uh, <clears throat> at that time, you know, is Israel, you know, was Palestine, and uh, we were always uh, <clears throat> talking about, you know, we had somebody there that to talk us about uh, about Jabotinsky, the big capo, you know, of the of the Jewish people. Um. Did you attend any kind of a Hebrew school or a cheder when you were a young boy? No. And the synagogue that your family went to, the Sephardic synagogue, um, could you describe it for us? Tell us what it was like. I really don't remember too much. I know that the synagogue was across from uh, from a, a, a river. You know, when when was. Uh, when we had a lot of uh, rain that became a river, and across from that was a synagogue. It was very close to to the house in walking distance. Uh, I don't, don't remember what it looks like right now. So, um, the school that you went to, you said before, was an Italian school. Uh, how many years did you attend that school? Uh, I attended from uh, uh, from elementary school. It was uh, about the five and four, nine years. And after you finished school, what did you do? Uh, after I finished school, once I couldn't go to any university, and uh, my father arranged that I work for the same newspaper he was doing. But at that time, just translating from uh, Italian to Greek or French to Greek at that time for a while. And um, wh when was that approximately? How old were you? Uh, that was in 1938, 38 to 40, in, um, I was uh, 16, 17. Tell me something. While you were uh, growing up in Salonika in Greece, did you ever experience any kind of anti-Semitism? Oh, yeah. In 1933, I uh, was uh, quite a bit of anti-Semitism, especially in the Jewish uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, there were two, three neighborhoods, and uh, then at that time was uh, the they call it the three E's, were an organization that was uh, against against the Jews. Can you tell us what that stood for? The letters? Do uh, you know? I don't know. Three epsilon. They call it in Greek. Uh, uh, was an organization that uh, was against the Jews at that time. What, what type of uh, anti-Semitic activities well, were going they, on? They would they try to burn the neighborhood, so doing, you know, put fires. That's that's why my my uncle that lived in a different neighborhood, you know, decided to take his family and go at that time going to Palestine. Uh, around what year was that? Again? 1933. So it it kind of corresponded to when Hitler was coming into power in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you were pretty young at yeah. that time, but was there any talk within your home between your family of what was happening or what oh, they yeah, thought? Yeah, sure, we were all aware what was happening, but uh, I, uh, I think uh, since we were Italian citizens, uh, they, they wouldn't, they were, they knew where we were, so uh, we were pretty safe. What kind of uh, books and newspapers did you have in your home? We, we had all kinds, you know. First of all, we had a lot of Italian, Italian books and newspapers, and especially Greek newspapers. My father was working, bringing home all the time the newspaper he was working on. 
Do you like to read as a young Yes, yes. What always. Kind of? uh, I, uh, I always, uh, w I, I like, uh, I don't read books enough, but I read a lot of uh, magazines and newspapers. I always want, want to find out what the world is all about. So as you got a little older and things started to progress in Europe, let's say around 1938, do you remember reading about things that were going on and what you thought? Oh, yeah. We were, we were reading, no, especially in 1939 when the war started, you know, with uh, Germany, you know, declaring war to Poland. Uh, at that time, you know, then the Italians also in 19, a year later, in 1940, declared war to Greece. So what happened during that time that the Greeks took our family, uh, I, they left my father and my little brother home, and me, my brother, and my father, they took us in a camp, a concentration camp in southern Greece. What for, was it called? Uh, in Argos, Greece. That, that was the, the camp. But since all the Italians, uh, some of the Italians were very well known and very good friends of the king of Greece, after a few months, they decide that they will pay their own way and bring them to uh, close to uh, Athens in Marusi in a, in a small hotel where they were the, the, uh, the rich people will pay for everything and we stay there until the end of the war for another six months. We were just, just close in in a, in a hotel, you know. Be before you uh, went to this hotel in Athens, when they came and took you away from your yeah. home, what was the, was, what did uh, they tell you? Why were they taking well, you? Well, because we were Italian citizens, and then they, they thought uh, once uh, Italy declared war, we would be with Italy instead of with Greece. We were Italian citizens, and always our, uh, you know, we were Italians. <coughs> what was this camp like in Argos? Uh, in Argos, wasn't bad. You know, the, the, it was uh, after I went to <laughs> to Poland. You know, that was uh, was pretty good, <laughs> and especially when we moved us to a hotel, we just stayed there until the end, doing nothing really. And how long were you in this camp? In until Argos? 1941, for a year. So it was approximately both. Yeah. One year. And uh, so after you left this camp and you went back to Athens? I went, no, we went, we, I went back to Salonika in 1941. At that time, the Germans came in. Uh, before going back to Salonika, let me uh, just clarify something. After the camp, you went to this hotel. Hotel in Marusi, which is close to Athens. And from there, when we finished, we went back to our homes in, in, uh, in Salonika. How, how long were you in this hotel? Uh, few months, five, six months, probably. And the whole time you were there, what were you doing? Nothing. We were, we were nothing to do, really. We were just reading and going. Was you know They had a, a big uh, outside of the hotel, so we stayed around there. It wasn't bad. It was very good at that time. Did you have people guarding you or making sure no, that you stayed? No, not really. Yeah, there, there was a guard, but uh, just on the one guard. And, they were very close to the king, most of the Italian Jew, to the king of Greece. And uh, they had very good relationships. So I think he arranged to, to be, once they were, they cost nothing to the Greek government. So after uh, returning to Salonika, what were things like when you came back? Well, when I came back, the newspaper didn't exist anymore. The Germans came in, they closed the newspaper. And uh, I... I was trying to to find a job actually for uh, <clears throat> over a, over a year another uh, Danish uh, cousin the father had a mill to grind up uh, uh, the uh, uh, what they call it uh, to make bread you know just uh, the the wheat you know they were coming from the uh, Around uh, around uh, Salonika, the people they had uh, wheat, you know, they had to mill it. So they came down to us, and I worked for a year, you know, all night long, actually doing that kind of work. When was to, this? Oh, that was in, from 1941 to 1943. 
when the Germans started surrounding the, the Jewish people. So in that period of time, 1941 to 1943, generally, how would you describe the life for the Jews in Greece? For at one point was okay the first year, but then I think the Germans started uh, asking a lot of questions, going to the Jewish community and find out who they are. You know, they started to, to have, uh, you know, I think in 1942, the uh, what was the um, the head in Germany, the wall, what was the uh, the meeting they had for the final solution? Uh, Wine, Wine, the YNC. <clears throat> so after that, you know, that they start uh, just going after the Jews of Salonga. There were lots of them. So this is our. But we went, we left in 1943. The Italian government put us in an Italian, they call it Tradotta, in an Italian. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, they were coming to Salonica, you know, railroads from Italy, and they took us to the Italian part of. Uh, Greece, was half of it was uh, uh, the Germans, and uh, from Larissa down to southern Greece, the Italians occupied them. And they put us in a school where we stayed there until I was uh, caught by the Germans in the synagogue in March uh, 1944. Before we get to that, um, while you were still in Salonika, before you left, um, were the Germans that were there treating the Greek Jews differently than the Italian oh, Jews? Yeah. What did you see at that time? Well, we uh, they didn't they didn't do as we had in our door. We had from Italian from the Italian consulate a piece of paper that they were were Italians. <clears throat> so the Jews they didn't touch us. They, they didn't do anything, even though that they were complaining to the Italian authorities. Uh, the Italian government said that they shouldn't touch us. What uh, what types of things did you see happening to the Greek Jews around you? Well, they were uh, they were doing uh, you know little by little they were putting in ghettos, and then they s I didn't see too much. I I saw when they start taking them you know because I had a lot of friends of mine you know they went from Salonika, uh, friends from school and and uh, regular young friends of mine that. Uh, <clears throat> they were taken, and you know they started transports. I was already when they start taking them. I was already in Athens. <clears throat> so, before you left for Athens, um, would you say that your life pretty much went along as yeah, it did before? Went along. Yeah. Um, were there problems with um, the Jewish people? and uh, the Germans that were occupying the area as far as uh, collaboration was involved. Did you witness anything like that? No, but I, when I was in Athens, you know, I, but uh, there were always uh, Jewish traitors around uh, the whole thing. But, you know, they, they saved themselves for a while, but at the end they all perished. So when the time came for you to leave Salonika and go to Athens, when was this exactly? <laughs> Um, was in nineteen in nineteen forty three. Okay, I'm going to stop the tape now. We're going to change the tape. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gabay, you were just telling us that in nineteen forty three you left Salonika for Athens. Who did you go with? Uh, the whole family went, and they took us uh, down to Athens in a in a school. Uh, at the suburbs of Athens called Wuzi. And we stayed there and uh, we went doing our lives trying to, you know, my family wasn't working and I was the only one trying to do some, uh, ac actually a black market thing to be able to make ends meet at the time. That was Where was your food coming from, your supplies? How were you living? Well, I was I was I was working really, buying and selling different items, and I uh, have a lots lots of friends also in Athens that they help, giving me some support, and uh, I, I was able to maintain. You know, uh, we didn't have to pay rent or anything; just uh, 
we had the everyday life uh, going, so it was, it was not, so, not so bad. How many people would you say were in this school? Oh, there were, they were uh, I would say, a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred people. That they came, you know, Morris uh, Venezia was there with his family. Any of your other friends? Uh, no, Danny wasn't there because uh, he, uh, they had enough uh, money to be able to be able to ha have a few places to go from here and there. But uh, we we weren't able to to have any anything you know tangible that we'll be able to to go and find a place to live. At that point in time, uh, were you aware of what was happening to the transports that had been taken out, or what was going on in Eastern Europe? No, no, we didn't know anything about what what, what really the fate of the Jewish people there were. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. That that's why when uh, we used to go to the synagogue and give our presents, you know, the Germans wanted us to go so often every week and give a present. And one day in in March 1944, 24 of March 1944, they came in, they surrounded us, and that was it. From there we went direct to, to Haidar. Before that happened, and uh, you were still living in this school, um, along with working on the black market to try to make extra money. What uh, what other things did you do? Were you involved in any kind of organizations no. or? I I I I didn't I didn't know too much about at that time to get involved in anything. <clears throat> did you think about trying to escape or run away? Thinking, but uh, you know, thinking wasn't enough at that time. You had to have the means to do it. And without means, even people with means to do it, they weren't able to. It was, uh, was a very treacherous time. Uh, you know, there were people that they were uh, going from, uh, from Greece to Turkey and from there to the Middle East. But uh, these people, you had to have substantial amounts of cash or gold to be able to make a project of that kind. So after being in this school for a while, uh, what happened that caused you all to leave? How did it happen? Well, we went one, one day, we went to the synagogue to, to say present. You know, you had to go there and be, be present yourself there every week. So at that week, the Germans came in and they surrounded the synagogue. So there's nothing else you could do. <clears throat> but nobody knew, really, nobody knew that such a tragic thing will happen at the end. Everybody knew, okay, so we went to a concentration camp, we go to another, a year or two, the, the war will be over, everybody will come back. And nobody knew. Nobody knew about the final solution. So when the Germans came to take you from the synagogue, who were you with? Uh, my family was there, you know, and I, the only one I remember was the Venezias were there. How, how did they take you to Haidari? What, what exactly happened? Uh, I don't even remember anymore what happened. They just, I know that I found myself on that place, Haidari, there, in, in, it was a camp. They were amassing, you know, to have another transport. I didn't, we didn't know. But it happened on April uh, 2nd. Why do you think they took you? I mean, what do you, what do you think made it happen that day? Or, or why didn't it happen before? Do you have any idea? No. no nobody, nobody knew. They were, try, they were trying to surround all the Jews. And there were these two, <coughs> a lot of traitors there, uh, I knew. And there were the two people there, that uh, the Pepo and uh, Costa Recanati. These people, they're very, very, very bad. You know, they, they used anything that they, they will know where is a Jew, they will take the Germans there. I don't know why, because at the end, nobody survived from these people. They were the last one to die. So when you arrived at uh, Haidari, what were the conditions like? Describe them for us. Uh, I don't 
you know, you, you go to a camp and I, you don't know anymore. You, they give you a place to sleep and, and on the floor or whatever it was. At that time, you, you don't know what your mind goes through. And uh, I didn't even pay attention to that. You know, I was waiting day by day by day. When the day came in, they surrounded all of us and we went to, to Poland. We put them in these transports. I remember the only thing they, they put in was the Red Cross was there that to help us with some food, you know. But we were hundred and some people in each wagon. I don't remember anymore what, how did we do it, how we went to, a, to do our regular things. And I don't remember. The only thing I remember was day and night the train was going until arriving in Auschwitz. There were, you know, a lot of sick people, and uh, I, I think there were some dead people there arriving at the end. Uh, before, before we talk about that, uh, let me just ask you, how long were you in Haidari with your family? It was uh, just from uh, the 24th to the 2nd, not too long, not too long. <clears throat> and when they finally came to take you, who took you? The Germans. And how did they take you? How did they take you from Haidari to the trains? Well, they, they, they put you in, in uh, trucks, you know. Just, uh, and <clears throat> uh, who were you with in the car, in the wagon? I remember my family. I, I don't know. I, but uh, I know I, when we were in the wagon, was I know we were together with the Venezia family together, the only family that w was at that time together. Did you think of escaping? Did you were yeah, we, th we thought of escaping, but uh, my father was adamant. He didn't want to, to have a thing like this. Um, it was very difficult because it was uh, a small window. There were bar barbed wires. That I don't know how we could do it. It was very, very difficult. Where do you go, really? How do you escape? The train is going, going through Yugoslavia and, and all these countries. Uh, I mean, we weren't prepared. We weren't prepared. How long uh, would you say that the trip took altogether? I took uh, from the, I know we arrived there the 11. And when? From the 2nd to the 11, nine days. Did the train stop at any time? Oh, yeah, it stopped, you know. The, the, that wasn't a, f always they, they left passages for other trains that are more uh, important. But we, it took nine days to go from from Athens to, to Poland. Was there any food on the wagon that you The had? only food that, that there were were the food from the Red Cross. But I think we weren't even hungry about this. Everybody was thinking and thinking and thinking. Mind goes wild. What kind of conversations did you have with your family at that time? I don't know if we had any conversations. When you arrived at uh, Auschwitz after this nine-day journey, can you describe for us the very first thing you remember when that door opened up to the wagon? The first thing that I remember is that the SS always is schnell, 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 <clears throat> right? And, you know, we got into line, and uh, there were Mengele was there making the selection, always with his two fingers. <clears throat> Most of the fingers went on the on the right, and <clears throat> which is going direct to the crematorium. On the left was he was selecting ten percent of the young of the every transport. Ten percent, I will say, went to work. The others were direct to the crematorium, and I knew that after a while. When you were still standing on the ramp with your family, tell us what happened step by step. I really don't remember step by step. But I can tell you that there, there's nothing, uh, after they selected you, it's very fast. Everything is going fast. You go there, and then they take you. You go to, uh, to the quarantine. Were you able to uh, say goodbye to your family? Were you able to no, see what happened to nothing, them? Nothing, nothing. You couldn't see anything anymore. Uh, they went direct to the gas chambers. I know now because I was there. So uh, after the selection, 
Who were you with and where did you go? I remember I was with, uh, I always were with the Venetians together and then Danny was there, you know, and the Najaris were there, different other people, but <clears throat> we went to the quarantine where we stayed for quite a while. They gave, they gave you a, you know, you go there and they start to cut your hair, <clears throat> they put your number. Did you have mm. a number tattoo? Yes. The Can number you show one, it? Yeah. The number was 182568. And what about uh, your brothers? Where were they at this time? Oh, my brother's the one went direct, you know. What happened to my little brother is that uh, seeing that uh, I think he was selected to go to work, but seeing that uh, the mother and father went to the truck, so he ran with them. And he went direct to the gas chambers. <coughs> and your older brother? My older brother, we stayed together. We were all, all together. So after you were tattooed, what happened then? Well, I think they, they give you a hot and cold shower. They give you, stay waiting for hours on the corridors, you know. And then they, they give you something to wear and they assign you to a bunker, you know, you go to to block 13. You, no, first you go to the quarantine block where you stay there for, for a while, for about 30 days. What was that like? Uh, we didn't do anything really, you know. You had, uh, they give you a cup of soup for lunch and uh, some margarine with a bread for dinner. And uh, I don't know, the time went by until we found ourselves, uh, they selected us to go to, go to, uh, to work, and they put us on Block 13, which was the Zonder Command. When they selected you from the quarantine, who was it that selected you? Do you remember? No, I don't remember, but uh, uh, there were, uh, the, the, actually, they came with a list. I don't remember exactly what happened. I, I know I found myself in, in that uh, Block 13 of the Zonder Commando with a bunch of uh, people with us. We're about, uh, we're the, I think we're 35 Greeks. In, uh, when you were still in the quarantine, how many of you were there all together, would you say? Well, uh, I don't know, we're, we're about 150 people, probably. And uh, were, you sur were you guarded? Were you able to go oh, yeah, out? You were, you or? Were, you, yeah, we were in a, in a camp. You were in a camp. The, actually, the ESS, there's had nothing too much to do when you were in the camp. You, they, they assign their capos, you know. They are the ones that they really try to, to put the things in order. They are the ones. And uh, in the quarantine, was there a capo that was oh, overseeing yeah, you? Yeah, was, uh, I don't even remember their names myself. How was the treatment? Uh, always rough. Treatment is always rough. You know, you have to be first thing in the morning, everything okay, you know. <clears throat> Especially the people that are really going out to work with, uh, with a couple of SS and the capos and, and the, the dogs, you know. Even today, I, I can't stand the dog. I, I just, a dog and, and a policeman, when I see, my heart beats <laughs> very fast. So um, while you were in the quarantine, did they give you any kind of work at all? Were you in contact with the rest of the people in the camp? No. no I, I, I don't remember being in touch with anyone except the people that were in the, in the quarantine. So uh, when this selection was made and you were taken to Block 13, what happened when you arrived? Did you know where you were going? No, we didn't know anything. They just, the only thing I remember when we were in the Zonder, the first day of Zonder Commando, I see about 25 or 3,000 people coming in, you know, they were putting their, you know, their, undress 
going there. And <clears throat> the only one thing I remember that always the SS were saying is, uh, take your shoes and zusammen machen, you know, put them together as a pair and take it in your hand and walk in through the corridor, come into the, before going into the gas chamber, you had to leave it. Somebody was taken there. What my my first observations of that is that I saw twenty five to three thousand people going on the on the gas chamber, and uh, they closed the doors. And uh, you know, n then I knew that the SS through the Cyclone B, you know, from uh, above three four openings, and uh, when. You know, it takes about four or five minutes to die, except the people that are in front where the gas is coming, that it takes them out a couple of minutes. And after, after that, you know, when after 15, 20 minutes they open up the thing, the first thing I see, I saw the people I saw 15 minutes before alive. I saw the mothers with the children standing up before, because the gas chamber will, will take maybe 500 people, it used to make 2,500 people, everybody standing up. There was no room for anything else but standing up. And when you see that after, it's, you know, some of them are black and blues from the gas, it's, it's something that I said to myself, how can you, somebody, be able to survive in such an environment? Well, the first thing they did, they gave us a, a pair of scissors to start cutting the hair. Well, where do you go? You start the one, two, then you, I have to put my, my foot on top of a, somebody's <clears throat> stomach. And I, from the gas, I heard the, ah, big. So I jump up 100 meters away and I said to myself, how can I, how can I do it? How can I? There was a, a Polish guy there, and I said, where is God? And he says, God, this is what God is. You have to be very strong to survive. And I said to myself, the only thing I can do, that's why I don't remember a lot of things. I said to myself, I am a robot, and I, I did just this to my mind. And I said, from now on, close your eyes and do whatever is to be done without asking too much. This, this is how I, we went, at least for the first few months. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't survive by thinking every time that transport were coming or where that mall was coming, you know, with their motor, motorcycle at 2 in the morning, you know, and seeing this guy, this guy mall coming in and selecting the most beautiful girls and then <clears throat> He was a good marksman and, and just marks, marks them in the more sensitive places of their body, you know, and seeing in front of you dice and uh, how can you, there is, there is no comparison about humanity, what, there is no such a thing. Can you um, just clarify for us a little bit? who this man Mol was, explain to that, us. That, Mo, that was a, a, a guy that, uh, he was always, his left high was up and down, you know, closing and opening up. And he was the guy that was in charge of the crematoriums on the transports. And all of, he will come first. We, uh, mostly he will come about one, two in the morning. And we knew that behind that was a transport because they put the railroad cars on the steps of the, of the, where the chambers to undress was. You just in the crematorium, it was not you know, from direct. You know, everybody was coming direct. You know, and when I was there, you know, was the six hundred thousand people mostly from Hungary from Budapest and uh, I remember it was 70,000 from Lodge and Holland, you know, this Holland, beautiful people. It's, uh, it's indescribable, I tell you. Um, let me take you back a little bit because we really would like to get as much information as you're capable of giving us. and. Um, the very first day you arrived at the crematorium, they pu did they put you to work right away? 
Yeah, they gave me to cut uh, hair. But then, you know, they, they then after that, f first of all, you know, when we came in in the crematorium, the all the the streets in the crematorium outside were all <clears throat> from the bones. When we arrive, when we arrive after a while, you know, they they took out all the bones from and they pulverized them, all of them. And from then on, everything that was done, all the ashes were pulverized and sent it direct to the Vistula River that was very close to, the, to there. What, so, uh, what did the crematorium look like? Give us a description of what you saw. Was, they had a room where they were undressed. They had a gas chamber. Uh, they had uh, upstairs, we were living upstairs. They were <clears throat> first downstairs. Then you had to, there was an elevator going on the second floor. On the second floor were the eight ovens. <clears throat> and uh, we were put in the second floor after a while. And, and then we went upstairs on the second floor and put them in stretches and put them in the oven. And uh, just from the body fat, they didn't have to do anything. They started the woven, but then after all, the, the body fat of, of each person was given the flames. Did they give you any kind of an instruction as to how to do things or give you tools to work with? Well, you know, they give you all the tools, you know, when they had to, all the tools to, you know, every 20 minutes you have to turn them around, you know, whatever it was, you know. It takes 30, 30, 40 minutes to burn them. <clears throat> um, let's go back and try to do this chronologically, step by step. Um, when the people were taken into the gas chamber, can you give us an idea of what the inside of the chamber looked like? Did you see it? Yeah, it was, uh, they, they had some false showers, and there were a few openings where the, the cyclone B, you know, <coughs> was thrown from the SS. Well, the chamber, I told you that maybe we'll take four or five hundred people. We used to put 2,500 people. And the, the doors were hermetically closed. Well, the doors were like the, uh, the uh, butcher, this, you know, very, very good, good doors. And uh, there was a big, uh, where you can see, <laughs> they were coming from Berlin most of the time and seeing how the Jews were dying. And also, you know, at that time were also bunkers, not only crematoriums, where during the transports of the, uh, of Hungary, you know, they were, we were working about uh, two, three f shifts. And there wasn't enough, the, the crematorium couldn't burn enough, so they had 2,000, 3,000 bunkers. And there were a lot of SS girls laughing and laughing and w I, I couldn't see how a human being could do such a thing. <clears throat> um, did you have any contact with the people being brought in? Were you able to talk to them? Did they From talk time to, you? to time. From time to time, uh, we were telling, you know, just in, in a very few words, you know, that uh, they are going to die. And they were bringing in, you know, they, they thought that they are coming to we were very, very well nourished because uh, all the food that we were bringing in, we were eating it, actually. <clears throat> what kind of things would you find that they would bring in? Mostly in uh, a lot of, uh, um, I remember a lot of sardines in cans, lots of canned foods, <coughs> also some uh, cakes and this, this type of things that the people who are living in the house, you know, they thought that they'll come and they need some provisions for a few days. Or, you know. What were the reactions of the people when you told them what was going to happen? Well, they you know, they get flabbergasted. But not many times we had the opportunity either, you know, to, to tell them, you know, we were around there, you know, the SS were around. So, <clears throat> They could undress them right away. They were going direct to, to the chambers. And uh, since it takes a few minutes to die, you know, then they realize that they were dying, you know. So you always will find when you open the doors a lot of scratches in the walls of blood, you know, with the, they're going with their fingers, you know, scratching the walls to be able to get, 
get saved someplace, but there's no other. What language would you speak to these people? How would you communicate? Uh, I don't know. Depends. You know, we were talking, we were talking French, Italian, or whatever it was. You know, most of the people when we were there were hung from Hungarian, Hungarian Jews, uh, lots of them, lots of them. So, uh, when they would open the doors of the gas chamber, whose job was it to take the bodies out? Well, they 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 give us some. Um, canes, and you reverse the cane and you put it in, in there, and you drag them out because when the gas, they get very, very tight and, and it takes a long, a lot of uh, uh, force to be able to drag the bodies from, from the gas chambers, you know, to put it in the elevator going on the second floor and then, you know, in stretchers and in the oven. We had enough people there to do it. How many people would you say were working in each uh, crematorium? Uh, we were about 100, I think, in, in ours. How many? There were 1,200 people all together in the Zonder Commando, with the bunkers were here, with there. And, uh, you know, we were 100 in mine, under 150, you know. So it takes 40, 600, and the others were around for other things. So we, we, we had enough personnel. But, you know, we were working shifts also. You needed more people. How many of you were Greek? Uh, we were 35 Greeks. And at the end, I think we left on the 26th. So after taking the bodies out of the gas chamber and putting them on these elevators, then what would happen? Then you go to the, just you put them in the ovens. Who would put them in the ovens? There are, two other people, you know, that put it in stretchers, three, four of them in stretchers and put them in the oven. <clears throat> and actually they had to take, put the uh, outside the women and inside the men because the women have more fat that can, could burn the, the bodies. How many people were, uh, you, were you able to actually put inside of each oven? Uh, you put about four. And how many ovens were there working all I the time? I think in, in each crematorium were eight ovens. And uh, how long, again, would it take to burn? 20 to 30 minutes. So, so after, the, after the process was, was over of the actual burning, then what would you do? Oh, then, the, you know, they take the ashes out, and they, you pulverize the ashes, and they take them. The trucks come and take them to the Bistola River. <clears throat> uh, while you were doing this, who was overseeing all of this? Who was there that was well, in the charge? The capos on the crematorium. You know, we had only one or two guards there. It wasn't too many SS. They were always outside the crematorium. Every uh, three, four hours, there's, uh, you know, about uh, half a dozen well-equipped, you know, SS just moving around. But inside the crematorium were only a couple of SS, two, three SS. The couples were doing the job, the, the, that, the job of the head. I'm going to stop right now. We're going to change the tape, and we'll go on. Mr. Gabay, um, you were just telling us about the couples who were overseeing you. Tell us more about them. Who were they? Uh, the one that I know was one couple was Kojak. That was a very good one, you know, very helpful, you know, the guy that uh, in the beginning, you know, because... Uh, it, if he wasn't good, nice enough, you know, you couldn't survive there either. But the overall capo of the crematorium two, where I was working, was the, by the name of Kaminsky. Uh, he was very tough, but also inside, I think, of this man was something very, very good in it. And uh, I, he knew about the we used to make a, we like to make a revolution there, an uprising. And uh, he, the Germans, you know, after, after that, that the, you know, you want me to talk about the uprising? Actually, no. I'd, I'd like to no, wait right. on that a little okay. bit. Well, Kaminsky wants uh, one, uh, the overall capo. Uh, he was tough with us, but I think his heart, and he was a very nice, nice man. Was uh, he a Polish man, Jewish? Both Polish-Jewish men, yeah. 
How did you communicate with him? What language did you speak? Uh, I don't know. Just uh, we try. <laughs> Tell me, where did you sleep while you were working in the crematorium? We, we had an upstairs on the crematorium, upstairs. We were nice, uh, you know, bunkers to sleep. It wasn't, wasn't bad for us, you know. We, we had good clothing, you know. And we, we, our clothing weren't the one with, the, like, the camp. We would take a jacket from the people that were coming, and we had a jacket and a shirt. And so the, inst the, the problem with the Zonder Commando is not that when we were there, the, the uh, things that uh, the food or the clothing, it's the inside of your soul. This is, this is where our problem was. You know, it's very difficult to survive in circumstances like that, to be able to come out. We, we knew that we are not going to survive. How did you know? Because every six months, the Zonder Commando was always killed, gassed, and new people come in. This is our weekend. <laughs> How did you find out about that? Well, from, from people that were there, and they knew that every six months there were a selection. A selection going on. You know, always, always, there's a replenishing, you know. So we knew that it was impossible. We knew exactly from A to Z how the final solution of the Jewish people was made. And I'm going to tell you now that as far as I know, we are only three survivors today, in, 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 two in the United States, I think four. Two in the United States, we, one in Rome, and one in, in, I think, in Tel Aviv. And uh, when we are gone, you know, I don't think anybody, anybody can tell that I know that somebody was there and now somebody was there, but I, we are only why witnesses of the final solution. That's why it's very important, and that's why I went, you know, a few weeks ago, I just came back from Poland, you know, with the young people that are hungry of knowledge what was going on for the Holocaust. We're going to talk about that more <laughs> later on. But right now, um, you, you mentioned that you were able to take clothing mm -hmm. when you needed something. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. What kind of things were you finding that the people brought in, and what was done with those things? Well, they, they, the SS told us to search every, everything that they were, was coming in. So we had the facility uh, to take anything and put it aside, you know. Also, one of, of our men was a Greek guy by the name of Cohen, you know, <coughs> that... Uh, used to extract the gold teeth. And, uh, you know, they, they, when, when it happened that uh, we know we are not going to survive and we wanted to do something, an uprising or a revolution, you know, that was some things we were sending. The partisans were about 30 miles away from us. They were not too cooperative with us, but uh, just... Uh, we were sending money to them, and they were sending knives, dynamite, to be able to, to do something one day. And that's what's happened. How were you able to send money to them? Uh, th through parties. You know, there's always means. You know, people, you know, with money you can do anything. So going back to the things you found, let's say, for instance, the teeth, the gold teeth that were taken out of the dead bodies, mm -hmm. What happened with those things? Well, oh, the, the Germans were every day taking them away, you know. You, you put it in, in, a, in a can or whatever it was, and uh, they were taken. As a matter of fact, I was listening the other day that uh, in, in Switzerland, all this, uh, I don't know if you see 60 Minutes last week, all that gold belongs to the Jewish people. <coughs> What other kind of things did you find besides, obviously, the gold teeth? Well, they had money, dollars. A lot of people came with dollars. They had diamonds. And, you know, most of their possessions, they could put it in places, you know, that nobody would see it, you know. That <clears throat> like what kind of places? 
different places, especially when they were after, after they were dead. A lot of things were found, you know, in ears, in, in, in uh, I, I can't even mention it. Who would remove these things from those places? Uh, the, the, if, if we were around there, we'd remove it, you know. But we couldn't do nothing with it because there's no place to do it, you know. But we were going to the Germans. When you were not working and you were together with the others under commandos in your barracks, mm -hmm. let's say, what kind of things did you talk about? Well, always you talk about the old things, about the nice things to be free, <clears throat> to be able to do that, to be with your family. Uh, you know, we were young people. We were just uh, in the stage of our lives, you know, that you need everything, you know. To, to be able to survive and to have a nice life that uh, didn't happen. But most of the time, we were doing that. And uh, that, that took most of our time because we were working, especially the time I was there, <clears throat> there were a lot of work to be done. You know, it never stopped. Uh, how old were you at that time? I was uh, 22. And who were you with at, uh, during your work hours and in your free time? Who did you spend your time with? Uh, we were uh, together with my brother and uh, the two brothers of Venezia and Danny and uh, Marcel Najari that uh, he survived. He was on the one that uh, I think in 1980 they found uh, a bottle in the crematoriums with a few notes of his. He used to keep notes. He didn't tell anybody. <clears throat> he has a book in Greek that came out. And you, you mentioned that you knew what would happen to the Zonder Commando. Um, did you think about that often? Did you care mm. that you were going to die? Oh, sure, sure. We, we care. We want to. Life is too precious, you know. And we were too young to die. That's why we decided to, to make an uprising. And uh, <clears throat> the, the uprising was uh, initiated by, there were 19 Russians off from the, the army officers, and was one Greek uh, captain uh, by, the by the name of Baruch, that uh, they put together the uprising, and actually they put a date on the uprising, and the date couldn't be kept it was October 7, 1944. And the date couldn't be kept because at that time there were a lot of, uh, it happens that that day a lot of Polish people came to the camp. I don't know why. So they postponed. So the, the next day, the next day they postponed. Uh, the SS, uh, they, they arrest Kaminsky. And they took it in crematorium four, and they killed him there with a lot of gypsies. Speaking about the gypsies, did you uh, see the gypsies in the camp? Were you aware that they were there? I don't know if I gypsies, but we knew that there were gypsies there, yeah. They were killing a lot of Polish, too, you know. But, you know, 99.9% .9 were the Jewish people. Anyone that has a number is Jewish. The people, they were not Jewish. They didn't have no number. <coughs> what about um, the experimental block? Did you know what was going on there? Did you see it? I, I didn't know. I didn't know, but I know that Mengele was doing experiments, you know, on Block 10 in Auschwitz. <coughs> I think there is a, a lady here living here. I don't know if you, you interview her. No? But... Uh, that's uh, the, the name by the name of Tabo that I, I think was on that uh, block. And um, were you always working in the same crematorium? Yeah, always I work in crematorium too. What about the other crematorium in relation to where you work? Can you give us an idea of where they were? Yeah, they were uh, one, two, three, four across, across, not too far away, no. You could see everything was happening. And 
when they started bringing in all of these Hungarian transports, uh, was there more involvement with the SS? Did you see more SS taking part, perhaps, in the killings or shootings or, or gassings? No, but, you know, always when there were, if it wasn't enough of a transport, there always it was 10, 20, 30 people. We, they were coming, we had to, to take them by the ear and waiting there and behind the German will kill them go down and clean up the, and go into the ovens. If there were, if there no were, if there, when there were 1,500 or 2,000, then they put it in the gas chambers. But for a small amount, you know, they used to shoot it by individual. And uh, when the SS would shoot these people individually, where was this done? Done in front of us, in the crematorium. And you, you mentioned that you... You have to pick it up by the ear bring them that and keep them by the ear and the, the SS will be behind shooting them, you know, and they will die immediately, you know. They would go down and uh, somebody will pick it up and then we had to clean up the blood. Things that I, I, uh, I don't know, I just, it's very hard to say. What do you think the purpose was for holding them by the ear? What was the reasoning for that, do you think? I don't know, but to stand up, I don't know, not to move. Who <coughs> was doing the shooting at times like SS. this? SS. Did you know any of these SS by yeah, name? They were, yeah, they, um, I don't remember their names, but they're, one was a Holland guy from Holland, SS. He wasn't doing that, but there was another one I don't remember his name. He, is, he was a tall, red-faced man. That He was doing most of the shootings. Tall, very tall. Uh, how did these SS react to you? How did they treat you or, or behave towards you? Well, they were okay with us. You know, they didn't, uh, didn't, have, no, didn't have too much to do with them, really. <clears throat> While you were working in the crematorium, did you have... Um, a chance to ever see any of the important people of the camp come through or any high-ranking SS? They, they used to come, you know, after they were, they were bef before we opened up the gas chamber, they used to come frequently from Berlin. I don't know their names. I mean, there must be big people from Berlin uh, seeing how the Jewish people were dying. When, when these... Uh, SS officers would come to watch. Uh, what did you see? How did they act? What did they do? Well, most of the time they were happy people. Was it both men and women that would come? Yes. And the women, were they also SS? Yes. There were plenty of SS women, you know. <coughs> around the crematorium there, you know, especially on the, when uh, the bunkers were uh, in use, you know. There are a lot of women around there. Now, when you say the bunkers were in use, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, uh, when, when there were enough transports that the gas chambers couldn't hold it, you know, then they had to, you know, after the gas chamber, the crematoriums couldn't hold uh, thousands of people, you know. There were at one point, they were coming there, what, well, five, six, seven, ten thousand a day. <clears throat> so they couldn't hold the, the crematorium. So they had to, because it was easier to, to, to send, put it in the bunker and burn them in the bunker. They used to put some, uh, a, a lot of uh, <clears throat> foliage there and put some gas and then throw the corpse after the gas. Now, when you say bunker, are you referring to like a big pit in the yeah. ground? Mm-hmm. Who would uh, make sure that these fires kept burning? Who would put the bodies in these big pits? Uh, uh, you know, the crematorium people would put the bodies. Mm. And how long would these keep burning before the bodies were actually destroyed? Well, it, it, takes, uh, it takes hours, you know, for 2,000 people to be burned. <coughs> In in uh, in these pits, the bodies that were burning were they bodies that had already been gassed in the gas yes. chamber? Yes. Oh, sure. Were there any shootings that took place? Probably there were. I don't I don't remember. 
So in this time from April of 1944 until uh, you left Auschwitz, the months that you worked there, um, how did you come to be part of the plan for this uprising that you mentioned earlier? Well, we, we were told by, by the, the people they put the uprising together that there will be an uprising because we had to take part of it, not only crematorium two, but the three and four together. Were you and in contact with the other crematorium? Yeah, yeah. We were in contact. But uh, uh, the, what I remember is that uh, um, the, 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 we couldn't keep that the October 7 date because of, of that. So then Kaminsky was killed, you know. And then the next, after a few days, they, they selected 200 from the crematorium, from all the crematorium, 200 people, and they, they gassed them and killed them. Who selected? Uh, the SS selects, you know, where they were named. They come with the numbers, you know, and they selected. And they, they were time, you know. At, at that point, uh, I th if I remember correctly, it's just there were, in October, there were, the transport were easing up. There weren't enough transports. So they... Uh, after they selected the 200, they went to the crematorium four and they selected another 200. So at, the, at that time, I, I, I remember, was, uh, <coughs> we saw, it was early in the mornings when, when we saw some fires on, on crematorium, or crematorium uh, three. So, we went upstairs to see what was going on, and uh, then the SS told us to come down immediately, and, uh, and, this, uh, and there was uh, the, the uprising. No, we were, the crematorium too, we were ready to, to put fire and get killed with the crematorium, but there were the Polish people at that time in the crematorium too, didn't want us to do it because says, will be for no avail. For, so we didn't do nothing. So the hundred of us were taken to a room, and then Commandant Kramer came in and registered all our numbers. Before uh, we talk <clears throat> about that, uh, let me ask you, when the uprising was being planned, who exactly was doing the planning, and how did they get Gunpowder or guns? Well, they, they were, I don't know exactly, but the 19, the 19 uh, uh, Russians and, uh, and the Greek uh, guy, you know, they got together and uh, with the help of uh, sending gold or sending money there, we used to get all this from, I think, a manufacturer around, uh, around there called Union, U-N-I-O-N. Were you given any guns or gunpowder? No, no. We, we were told to, to get uh, dressed well, you know, that, that's the only thing. What was your job supposed to be in the uprising? What exactly were you we, supposed we to do? Suppose, we were supposed to, to cut the tires of anything that was from the SS, and, uh, and, and also if, if we could kill the SS, it was one SS in crematorium too. <laughs> So when you saw the burning in crematorium three, uh, what happened exactly? Were you able to do anything at all? Um, I don't remember. What, what happened is that uh, we, we went upstairs in our rooms to get better view of what was happening. And, uh, I, I need you to sit back a little <laughs> bit so we can hear you better. So when you went upstairs to see the fire, yeah. do you remember being upstairs and watching what was happening? 
Well, we, we were, were watching, but we couldn't see anything. Uh, also, you know, crematorium one uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, calling us. So I, I don't remember exactly what happened. You know, now, when when you say crematorium one was calling you, what do you, how is that? Well, they they see they when they see the fires, you know, they they thought that uh, uh, in crematorium one they thought that uh, uh, the Germans were killing all of us. So what they did, you know, they one of the Greeks in crematorium one says, "Let's go, th let's start the uprising," and uh, but. Uh, uh, and they had, they had also the dynamite, and they didn't put the dynamite. So what happened is the Germans, the SS came in, and they killed everybody on crematorium one. And what happened also is that the, the next day, they brought all the corpses of the crematorium one, and we had to put them, you know, in the ovens. When they brought these other Zondo commandos from crematorium one to you, um, had they all been shot? Yeah. What did you have to do? Nothing, just burn them. So while crematorium three was burning, uh, were you surrounded by SS? Yeah, we were surrounded by by SS, uh, uh, and and also you know in in crematorium crematorium three, you know, also there was also the uh, uh, they went and they <laughs> this SS came in. And they start shooting on sight, everybody. At that time, when uh, crem crematorium three was burning, did you know how it happened, or did you find out how it was burning, how it started, what no, happened? No, they start shooting. I, I, we don't know what how it happens. You know, that's why it didn't, didn't succeed the revolution. We were, we weren't coordinated enough to be able to do it, and then. As, as I remember, they were telling me that the, the partisans, they weren't cooperative enough for us, the Jews, to do the job. So when you were gathered together in this room, all of you, and earlier you said that Commandant Kramer, yeah, Kramer. came in, uh, what exactly did he say to you? Did you know what was happening? Nothing. They just, just uh, you know, I thought that we were going to get killed. But... Uh, what did they the, make you do? Uh, nothing. Just we didn't do anything. Then, then that happened in crematorium one, you know, and then everybody was killed. Did but uh, after that, what was happening is that uh, they, they, t transport stopped. You know, they came from. They selected another two hundred, and then they. Um, came from Berlin, came, uh, you know, they, they, they came in from Berlin and they say to stop, stop uh, uh, killing, stop killing and the transport stopped. This is, uh, this is how everything started. Now when we were, when that happens, we were, uh, the Zonder Commando, whatever we were left of us, I think 12, 200 of us were left, we were uh, just, uh, Cleaning the burn crematorium three. That uh, when you say cleaning, bur burn the crem burn the crematorium. Yeah, we were cleaning it out. You know, it was all burned up. And uh, were you interrogated at all? Did they ask you questions as who was in charge? Or what? No, nothing, nothing. Because most most of the people, a lot of the people of the crematorium one and three, you know. They start going in the fields. This is where the SS just kill everybody. So what happened after they came and they stopped the transports? What were you doing then? No, we were just cleaning the the, the crematorium one, one and no crematorium three, uh, and uh, and then we, we on January fifteen. The, the Germans were uneasy because the Russians were advancing from Krakow to Auschwitz. So what they did, they, they called 100 more from the 
to be from the Zonder Commando, and they send them in, other, in another. They, they say that they were sending him to another camp, and in them were all Polish, and Kojak was there. So, but we knew better. You know, they were killed right away. The other day, they were killed. Uh, you, you so, said, excuse me, but you said Kojak was there. T tell us again who Kojak was. Kojak was one of the capos of Crematorium Two. So we were only left uh, now 100 of us, and uh, uh, and 26 Greeks. And uh, January January 15, when the Russians were coming. <clears throat> The, on January 18, the Birgenau, Auschwitz and Birgenau, the Birgenau actually was evacuated. And we were on that block 13, and the Germans were mixed up. They didn't know what they were doing, so we came out of that block 13, and we got together with all the camp, with thousands of people, and started marching. They put us to march from Birgenau to Auschwitz. That took uh, quite a few hours, about uh, uh, three miles, two and a half miles. And who were you with at this time? I, I don't know who I was with. I was 2020 marching. I was alone. 2020 marching. I think my brother and Danny was together, but I was with other people. 2020 marching. We marched to Auschwitz, and from there, after stopping a few hours, we start walking for days, two, three days, walking. And I remember that very perfectly was the, uh, the 18th of January 1945, and outside was 23 below zero. And the only th thing that I can tell you today is that I survived by closing my eyes and saying how beautiful Athens with the sunshine, and repeating that, many times I start sweating. Believe me, I am telling you now, I had a blanket and I threw it out. And we marched, and we marched for days until we arrived to a railroad station where they put us in open wagons, there are 150 in each one, and we, after a day or so, we arrive at Mathausen. Uh, before you arrived to Mauthausen and while you were on this march with all these people, can you give us an idea of about how many people there were marching all together? Marching thousands of people. And whoever could march, the, the army, the SS, was behind us, and they would kill anyone that he couldn't make it. So we, we arrived much, much less in our destination of Mauthausen. When you got to these trains, had you been given any food during any of no, this time? No, nothing. When we left Auschwitz, we had, uh, I think, uh, 150 grams of bread and some margarine. That's the only thing. That I remember that I was walking uh, in Linz, and it was raining, it was raining, and I, I got down, and I put mud in my... I was eating mud, mud. We're going to stop right now and change the tape, and we'll go on. Mr. Gabay, you were just telling us that on the march, it was raining and you were eating mud. Can I ask you, while you were marching, did you see any of the general Polish population? Did you see people? No. Did anyone try to help um, you? This, uh, this was on, uh, already in Austria, I think, when, when I was, was day. And uh, there were a lot of people, but nobody was willing to do anything, you know. They were looking at us. Uh, probably they, they knew what was going on, really, but nobody came, came to help in any way. Uh, the only thing that I remember is uh, uh, when we were in the wagons and we were passing by, by uh, Czechoslovakia, you know, in uh, the town of uh, Brno, B-R-N-O, you know, in the station, I think there were some people, you know, trying to give us some food. That's the only, only one I know in Czechoslovakia. But uh, the other ones in Austria, no. So 
while you were on the uh, open wagons, about how long would you say you traveled on these trains? Uh, I think uh, maybe overnight. Did people die around you while you were on the wagons? No, uh, I don't remember. When the train stopped, where were you and what happened? Well, we must have we were in the, you know, the town of Mauthausen, which was the Danube River town. And uh, we, we started again to do the same thing, like uh, being in Auschwitz. You could, the selection time you go through, you take a, they give you a cold and cold shower, and if you have any hair, they cut your hair. And uh, then they assign you. I was there very little, you know, maybe, I don't know, a day or two if I was there. And then they assigned me to go to Melk. I was not too far away from there. And that was for the IG Farben. And uh, the, the, my work consisted, was very, very cold. And the only thing, uh, the work consisted of uh, just throwing a lot of sand on the conveyor belt there. And uh, that, uh, I, I was there until uh, April 1945. That means from uh, January. Yeah, quite a few months there. And uh, while you were in Melk, what were the conditions like there? The bad. Every, every condition is, you know, we weren't used to such a cold weather, very, very cold weather. And the only thing we survived is because working at the Zonder Commando, I was well nourished for the march. And, uh, and until there, you know, I was surviving, you know, even with uh, very, very little food. Uh, that came about uh, the, to the end of it when, from Melk, I went to Ebensee, Austria, you know, in April 1945. In, Ep then in Ebensee, the, the work there was in, in tunnels of, uh, in caves of mountains, moving stones of 100, 200 pounds from one place to another. The only thing they were waiting is to kill us. They were. They, uh, we heard the rumors that they want to put us all in the caves and then put a bomb and finish with us. But uh, they didn't succeed, you know. At, uh, and uh, it happens that one morning, you know, I just, I get up 5.30, it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and there is such a silence. Silence, nothing, nobody, just just heard the birds singing, the only thing. You know, Ebenze is a beautiful tourist place. It's one of the most beautiful places in Austria. And seeing around nobody, I come out, no guards, nothing. So we come out, you know, there was nobody in the camp anymore. It took a couple of hours and the American army came in and we start crying and crying and crying and uh, <clears throat> they start, uh, you know, taking care of us, and the only problem, I think, they were giving soups, and soups, it's, a lot of people had diarrhea, and, and that they died. I had uh, the knowledge of uh, find a chicken and some potatoes from I don't know where, I went all around, uh, because I was... 67 pounds at that time, you know. I couldn't resist more than another week. And uh, I used to eat every hour on the hour, a little bit, a little bit. It took me only a few days to have my strength. This is how I started, you know, when the uh, French uh, United Nations Relief came in and uh, they gave me a job to be able to. Bef before we yeah. get to that, let's go back a little bit and... Um from Melk to Ebenze, how did you get to Ebenze? What in, was the in, in reason? Trucks. And there's no reason. Probably they finished the work there. That that was, you know, A.G. Farben uh, uh, took, uh, you know, the German government gave him workers, and they finished the job, and they booked. They had to move with someplace else. They moved me to Ebenze, Austria. When you came to Ebenze, what did you see? What kind of a camp was it? There weren't too many people there, probably five, 6,000 people were there. And uh, I stayed very little there, uh, with a month probably. 
<coughs> what kind of condition were these people in that you saw? Very, 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 very bad people. Very, very, very. I don't think anybody could survive anymore. Uh, it's so much that uh, your body can take. After a while, you know, it's the end of it. And uh, in being in Ebenze and being so debilitated physically, how were you able to work with those stones? How did you do it? I don't know. I, you know, you get, I, you'll be surprised how the human mind and body can, when you have the, the volun, you know, voluntà, they say in Italian, you know, that to live, you know, and that is, we weren't, I wasn't giving up. I wasn't giving up. I've, when, when I left, when I left Birgenau, every place I went, the first thing they were doing is asking who worked in the Sonderkommando. They didn't want anyone alive from the Sonderkommando. They knew too much. We knew a lot. So we were all with our lips sealed, nothing. Nobody said anything. The minute you say anything, you are free, you are finished. So what do you think it was that, that made you not want to give up? I, I, you know, I had the, the will to live, to see the world, to see again what was going on. And, and most of all, I wanted to tell the world. I wasn't talking for many, many years. I wanted to take the world, you know, exactly what happened to the final solution. You know, <clears throat> was a very big experience for me that I went back now because I saw the other camps too, you know. I, I want to discuss that with you, but uh, let's, mm. let's go back to what we were talking about. So in Abenze, on the Day of Liberation, when you heard that incredible silence, did you know right away what was happening? Yeah, I know. I knew that the war was over. I knew that. So, uh, what happened when the Americans came in? What did they, you? They, you know, how can you describe? You know, you know, anything without anything wanted. You know, the you start crying and and the, you, from joy, from joy. You know, finally, finally, you are liberated and see what happens. So what did you do right after you got your strength back? I, I think back, you know, the, just uh, the, the uh, director de la Forêt came in from United Nations Relief, uh, I think uh, was 135. And uh, he uh, took me with him and he gave me instructions to, to take a, a 10, 12 Greeks, mo if they knew about uh, their butchers, you know, to go around and pick up anything I could take of meat or anything else to be able to bring to the camp to survive. And this is what uh, I did. I went down with these people and I used to take, you know, I went all around and I didn't ask too many questions. I said, just clean them up and bring them over. And this is how, for a while, I worked with them. And uh, What happened to the SS? Did you see them? Did you know what happened? Never. I never saw any one of them. Never saw. What about the capos that were in charge of you at that time? Uh, m most of the capos that were with the crematorium, they all died. They all of them. And in Ebenze? Uh, in Ebenze, I don't even remember if I had a cap. I know I, I was in a barrack, you know. I, in the morning, they tell me, go, you know, take me out. Take me in the, in the caves. It was nothing to do, just they wanted to eliminate us as soon as possible. And it uh, wasn't done. The Jewish people always will survive. I don't care what they do. So um, when you started working for this uh, relief, the, the relief organization, mm -hmm. Uh, what exactly was the organization called that you were working for at that time? The UNRA, U-N-N-R-A. And uh, how long did you work for them? I, I worked until uh, from, uh, a, from uh, a, a May 6th to June 21st. And then 
and then they they selected me and Danny. I was with Danny. You know, I have a story about Danny to tell you. Uh, a few days after the liberation, you know, I was walking in the camp, and I saw a pile of cadavers and a murmur, a, a voice, say, ah, ah. I, I, I was curiosity. What, what? They're all dead. What is the that the gen men doing here? So I went there and I, and I go close to him and I see his his uh, legs were all full of pus, you know. So I went around and I see it's it's my friend Danny. I said Danny, Danny, Danny. I took it in my arms. I took it in my barracks. And for days and days, with a little bit of fresh meat and everything, I, I brought him to life. And from there on, the two of us were the first one to leave Ebense, go to uh, also the Venetians were with us, the Bruno Venetia, you know, Shlomo, not the uh, not uh, Morris. Morris wasn't there. Uh, <clears throat> And we went in, I remember, with the, they put us in a truck and going to Bologna, and then from Bologna, but um, Shlomo got sick, he was spitting blood, and took him back, and they put, took him to Merano, to the a convalescent home there, where he had a, uh, he has one lung, only, and, but he's very well, he, su he survived, and we, me and Danny went to Rome, and from Rome we are the first Greeks to go by air, by plane to Athens, Greece. And when did you return back to Greece? Uh, July 4, 1945. When you returned and you arrived in Athens, what did you find there? What was it like? Well, you know, f when we were before uh, leaving, they, they said, don't forget, when you go back, you'll be a good life. A lot of money will be given to you and everything. Didn't happen. The Greek government took us and says, go. So I had an aunt, my aunt, that was uh, with uh, her husband and the family went to the partisans, came back, they were there, and we notified them, and they picked me up, and Danny has his own people there, and they nourished me. How long did you stay in Athens? Oh, I stayed in Athens from 45 to 51 when I came to the United States. I, you know, I worked for few years for the American Joint Distribution Committee. What did you do for them? I was the liaison between them and the Greek government, taking out all the food and clothing uh, they were sending to the uh, survivors without paying any duties. What happened to your brother Jack? Where was he? My brother Jack, uh, uh, I didn't know when I was there, but he showed up about four months afterwards. He showed up. He was in good spirits and everything. And a couple of months later, his wife showed up. <coughs> she was. Uh, she had, uh, I think, um, uh, pulmonary, degree, you know, uh, disease. And uh, but she got. She got well. And they both left in 1949. They went to Israel in a moshav, you know, uh, above uh, Kfar Saba where they live, and they had uh, two children and grandchildren. And uh, my, but the wife passed away about five, six years ago, and my brother passed away in 1994. And uh, what about the rest of your family? Did you ever find out exactly what happened to them, and when did you find out? When I was in the crematorium, I knew exactly what happened. Uh, did you ever return to Salonika? I returned to Salonika for a couple of days, uh, 45 years later. I didn't recognize anything. I wasn't interested anymore. It was only, you know, from all the 60,000 Jews that went to Poland, only 1,750 returned. You mean <coughs> 1,750 people returned? So uh, you, you mentioned that in 1951 you came to the United States. What made you decide to come to the United States? Well, since I was in Greece, uh, when the joint distribution closed, 
and uh, I was an Italian citizen living in Greece and start taking permits. That was the Truman Doctrine in 1951, where 250,000 displaced persons from, they could emigrate to the United States, and I was sponsored originally from the uh, Jewish community of Cleveland, Ohio, which they pay my expenses to come over, but <clears throat> I, um, I went there for a very short time, and I wanted to be on my own, so I came to California, where the weather is much better for me. I was used to it, warm weather. While you were in Cleveland, did you uh, meet any people, anybody there that became part of your life, or? No, I stayed very uh, short time. I I met uh, when I came to Cleveland. Became a very uh, nice lady to meet me, and uh, I I wasn't speaking English at that time, so we spoke French. And uh, he started asking, telling me that, uh, you know, we give 10 cents for a resort. I said, I want something to work. I'm not interested in having, you know. So he says, well, you know, my, uh, my husband is a sales manager for the Bloomfield Company of one of the biggest manufacturers of dresses, you know, just bought a, a new Cadillac 1951. And he would like a chauffeur, you know, he's having a hernia surgery now, but he'll be well in a few days. I says, I'm a, I'm a chauffeur. So he, uh, and I says, why don't we go to the DMV and get a, a license and, and I can take it in Spanish. So I went there and we got the license right away. And a few days later, he uh, took me and uh, he took, he, in a few words, he told me, you have to take me in 22 hours at the Mulebach Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. I said, uh, in my way, I said, go schlafen, you know, in the back. And uh, I take a card, you know, a, a map, and here I'm there in 22 hours. I took him to the Mulebach Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. I stayed there for a while, and uh, I, uh, first he told me, that, no, this is too expensive here. You have to go across the street. I said, yeah, okay. He was paying me well at that time, giving me $125 a week. Good money, so I I said okay. Then I'll come and help you. And the only thing I was smiling and showing the dresses to all these old ladies from Pasadena, you know, from around Missouri. There, you know, I was I was good in this world. You know, I knew enough. So I smiled, and he was writing orders. And he said to me, you know, move to me with me at the hotel. That's my then the Missouri the uh, Kansas uh, River was. Uh, uh, flooding up, you know, and uh, he said to me, I can't use you anymore. I said, okay. I called uh, New York, a friend of mine. I went to New York. From then, a friend of mine from California, we were traveling together, coming to this country, to the USA, uh, by the name of Nico Minardos. He was studying motion picture directing, and he was uh, nine years younger than I was. He wrote me a note in New York, he says, Beautiful girl, sandy beaches, California. I took the trail bus and I came. I'm here. <laughs> that was a story. And in 1953, uh, I made a picture with motion, with the uh, 20th Century Fox. At that time, Spiro Skouras uh, was uh, uh, wanted to have uh, about 300 Greeks uh, and select eight of them for a movie. In 1953 was the Korean War, a Greek battalion fighting Korea. So one of the eight, I was the one. I worked with Victor Machur, Alexander Scurby, and Lee Marvin. What, what was the name of the film? Uh, the Glory Brigade. <clears throat> Why did you end your acting career? Uh, because at that time, I saw most of the actors were in the unemployment lines. And I said that... Uh, in this country, you have to start from the bottom, not from the top. So I went uh, one day that, uh, and I up made application for Lensol Fabrics, and I start sweeping the floor. And a year later, became a director of one of the companies. So. And did you get married? I got married in 1953, and I was married for 24 years. Then we got separated. We have a daughter which uh, finish uh, Berkeley University. And, but unfortunately, for 11 years, she's uh, with 
um, fibrositis or fibromyalgia is a disorder of disorder, a disorder of the muscles. There is no cure. And uh, two, three years ago, she fell down from a balcony and she broke her feet and her back. And unfortunately, she's in a wheelchair for uh, now for a long, long time. So my ex-wife takes care of them, and I take care of them. What uh, can you tell us their names, please? And the, the name is uh, Rhoda Allegra Gabay. This is your daughter. My daughter. And when was she born? She was born in 1915 of December 1957. And who is she named after? She never after her grandmother. And uh, your former wife's name? My my former wife's name is uh, Dana Rosalie Gabay. And. Now, uh, what do you do with your days? What do you do with your time? Well, I must, most of my time, I still, uh, now that I'm retired, I, I still go on and keep my acquaintances with the business I was in. And uh, <clears throat> two, three hours from uh, 12 to 3 in the afternoon, I always uh, go to a, I belong to a spa for many, many, many years. Uh, I do exercise for 40 years, and I, I try to have a quality life, not quantity. Um, let me ask you, uh, in <clears throat> all these years since the war, have you suffered with uh, nightmares and... Uh... The first 10 years were, were terrible nightmares, you know, practically daily or weekly, you know. And my ex-wife was very good for me. You know, she she took care of me very very nicely. <clears throat> but uh, still, from time to time, now once we are talking, I was in Poland about uh, the 12th of October to the to the 20 to the 19. I was in Poland. I went to Auschwitz and Birkenau, and. I had 22, uh, the director of the Aish Hatora from London is the son of a good friend of mine, and he asked me if I will accompany, accompany them, the 22, 24 people, mostly girls and boys, 20 to 30 years old from the University of London, to, uh, they were, they wanted to have a lot of knowledge and want to have somebody that was there, and especially that I was in Zonderkommando. So we went to all the camps, and when we arrived in Birgenau, uh, I went to crematorium too, which we destroyed half of it when we were there, and I found it exactly the same way after 52 years. My Danek is intact, is just what it was, uh, before when when they started, and uh, I was very surprised to see Treblinka in a forest where very few. <coughs> they tell me that very few Germans knew where Treblinka was because whoever went there could never come back from there. And uh, the only the only thing there are stones from all the Jewish communities from the world, the, the Jews that perished there, was quite a trip for me and these uh, young Jewish people that were so caring and loving that I can't tell you. What kind of things did these young people ask you? What kind of things were you able to share with them? Well, I share all my experiences. How was it for you now that you've done it? Well, I, I think uh, something came out of, of my, my soul. Now that it's um, almost 52 years since your liberation and since you were there, is there any kind of uh, a message that you'd like to give for future generations? Anything that you'd like to say to anyone who might be watching this tape? I hope that uh, history doesn't repeat itself. And uh, always to be strong. And uh, nowadays, uh, that, uh, you know, the state of Israel will be able, you know, 
And he knew that wants to go and uh, and be there to be safe and sound. Is there anything that I may have forgotten to talk to you about, or anything you may have wanted to say that perhaps you thought of? No, I I think we covered pretty good, you know, the story. I'm happy to tell. I I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your testimony with us today. Thank you. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my father, Victor, my mother, Rosa, and my uh, older brother, Jack. That was, uh, I, I will say, in the 1920s. Where do you think this picture was that, taken? That was in Salonica, Greece. Uh, this is uh, my uh, little brother, Samuel Gabay, and that was also in Salonica, Greece, and the time of the picture uh, should be in the 1927-28. When was your brother born? Uh, when was Samuel born? And in uh, 30... <laughs> was was born in in thirty two, so I was being in the thirties, nineteen thirty eight. Sorry. <laughs> this is uh, my father Victor Gabay and his brother Jack Gabay. Um, picture in Salonica, Greece, in the thirties. Which one is your father? My father is my my right, and his brother on his left. So your father is the one with the mustache? Yes. Uh, this is the first picture there on your right. It's my father, Victor, my mother, Rosa, my little brother, Samuel, myself sitting down, and my aunt and uncle, uh, aunt uh, Sarah and uncle Jack. And their last name was also Gabay? Yes. And that's you, Dario, yes. kneeling down in the front? Yes, in front, yes. And where was this picture taken? That was picture in Salonica. That was before the war. So that uh, could be 1938. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a diagram of uh, Birgenau with uh, crematorium uh, one and two, three and four. I was on crematorium two, and our uh, uh, we were uh, sleeping on the upstairs of the crematorium. Now, uh, this diagram is marked K2, K3, K4, and K5, because in actuality, K1, K1 crematorium one was the Auschwitz is, crematorium. Correct. So what you were calling, you the Zonderkommando in Birkenau, were calling one, two, three, three and four. four were, were two and three. So uh, number the one that's marked K3, which was actually your crematorium two. 2, that's where you lived? Yes, that's where we lived. And the one that we show here that's marked K4? Is crematorium 3 that was burned. Thank you. <coughs> uh, this is a crematorium. I don't know if it's Auschwitz or not, but this is how the Zonderkommando was performing their duties just uh, how they were putting in. That's a small, small oven. We, we had big ovens. Uh, this is a picture just the day of liberation where a French photographer came in and took some pictures and gave it to me. So this is part of it. So this picture was taken at Ebenze? That was taken at Ebenze on, on May 6, 1945. And what country is Ebenze and in? And Ebenze in Austria. This is also Ebenze, Austria, also the second day of liberation where a lot of cadavers were all around the camp and they were starting, uh, you know, taking them for burial. This is also another picture at Ebenze, Austria, during liberation time, about uh, 
May 7 or 8, 1945. And this is a, just a 25-year-old man. This is a picture of me with uh, two Danish cousins. Uh, uh, they are all also Ben Nachmias. This is Nina Ben Nachmias and Mati Ben Nachmias. This picture was taken in Salonika in 1946, uh, probably around uh, June 1946. This is uh, Maurice Venezia and me, Dario Gabay, in 1947, walking in the, one of the main streets in Athens, Greece. And which one uh, is the I'm, I'm on the right and more is on the left. This is my brother, Jack Gabay, and his wife, Laura Gabay. Uh, that picture was taken also in Athens, Greece, in 1947. That, that is uh, uh, an Auschwitz uh, uh, Certification, you know, certificate in our switch that given given to me uh, when uh, during the the camp. And I think I think uh, that's an Ausweis, which means uh, um, a pass to a leave. Pass. And uh, it says here from Mathausen. Mathausen to yeah. where to? I, I think this was probably an identification yeah, card. From yeah. that you received and uh, the date here says uh, the 17th of June 1945 is that correct? Oh yeah Th that's that's in Ebenze they gave it to me in Ebenze. Yeah on the far right at the bottom I mm -hmm. think it says Ebenze. Uh, this is a reference letter given to me by uh, the director of the U UNNRA, the UNRA 135 in Ebenze, Austria, on the name of the commandant, the director was De La Forêt. I worked for him for uh, uh, a month or so, bringing uh, the food. This is a document of the American Joint Distribution Committee when I was working there from 1946 to 1950. Uh, and. Uh, in there's a translation of the English and Greek. This is a picture of me, Dario Gabay, in 1949, uh, after I came back uh, a few years and I was well nourished. This is uh, my daughter, Rhoda Allegra Gabay. Uh, this picture was taken in, in uh, San Francisco, actually at the wine country in San Francisco uh, about uh, five, six years ago. So about 1990? This is a picture of uh, Treblinka. Uh, when I was there about a few weeks ago. And this is the stone that uh, all of the communities of the world, they put, they put a Treblinka, and this is from Greece. Uh, this is a picture uh, outside the hotel in Warsaw, Poland, with uh, some of the group that I went on October 15, 1996. This is also a stone in Treblinka where uh, the, they say, never again. How many languages can you see there? Uh, there, are, um, there is in French, uh, there is in Polish, and uh, I think uh, there is in uh, Russian and Hebrew.